Welcome back to our introduction to causal inference course. And today I want to continue our discussion about the required conditions for estimating causal effects. More specifically, I will talk about the second component for a well-defined causal contrast, the assumption of irrelevance of varying forms of the exposure. The problem here is that if there are multiple versions of one or more levels of the exposure, the causal effect can be difficult to interpret. That is, the causal effect will be ill-defined in this situation. And what I mean by that is the situation where the exposed or unexposed groups are defined sort of vaguely. We will see examples of that in a minute. So that two individuals, say both classified as exposed, actually have different levels or different versions of the exposure. And for that reason, the potential outcomes are also different. To have a more concrete idea of this problem, let us consider a simple example involving the effect of overweight or obesity on mortality. So here we have a situation with four individuals, one, two, three, and four, and each one of them has a different nutritional status. Individual one is underweight, individual two has normal weight, and so on. So based on that, we can classify individuals into whether or not they are overweight or obese or not. So individuals three and four would be classified as exposed because they are overweight or obese, and individuals one and two would be classified as unexposed. So notice in this example that we have our exposure variable X and a more refined version of the exposure variable, which I am represented by X prime. So what I wanted to draw your attention to here is that uh, let's consider individuals one and two first. Both of them are unexposed but their actual nutritional status is different. And this is happening because the way I am defining being unexposed is very vague, therefore is compatible with very different things. After all, being underweight is very different than being normal weight. And similarly for the exposed group, this group is also defined in a very sort of broad and vague way. And therefore it contains individuals that are overweight and are obese, even though those two things are very different. And why this might be a problem? To see that, let us consider uh, the potential outcomes for each one of those individuals. And for simplicity, I am assuming that they have the exact same potential outcome. So here we have the potential outcome under no exposure and the potential outcome under exposure. But notice we have two potential outcomes under unexposure and two potential outcomes under exposure. And this is happening because, as I mentioned previously, being unexposed is actually very vague. You can be unexposed because you are underweight, or you can be unexposed because you have normal weight. And in our example here, the potential outcomes are actually different. So in this example, if individual one is underweight, he is going to die over the course of the study. And if individual one is normal weight, he's not going to die over the course of the study. Similarly, for the potential outcomes under exposure, Again, we have two because being exposed was defined very vaguely and it is therefore compatible with two very different things. So in this situation, individual one would not die over the course of the study had he been overweight, but would die over the course of the study had he been obese. So notice here that I no longer have a single potential outcome for a given level of the exposure. I might have two or more potential outcomes for the same level of the exposure. The reason here being that the way I defined the exposure groups is very vague. So this example illustrates a situation where we have two quote unquote versions of each exposure group. For being unexposed, you can either be underweight or have normal weight. And for being exposed, you can either be overweight or obese. And this creates an ambiguity in the question of what is the effect of overweight obesity, even if we know the potential outcomes for each individual. Let us see why this happens. We define the individual level causal effect as a contrast between the two potential outcomes. But notice that in this example, I don't have a, a unique potential outcome under exposure, and I don't have a unique potential outcome under no exposure. So when I say what is the individual level causal effect, I'm not sure what comparison we are talking about. Am I comparing overweight versus underweight? Am I comparing overweight versus normal weight? Am I comparing obesity versus underweight? Or am I comparing obesity versus normal weight? 
And notice that if we were to take the values that I presented in the previous table and plug those in here, we will obtain different individual level closure effects. And this illustrates this more general idea that when the exposure is defined very vaguely, it is possible that a given level of the exposure is actually compatible with different versions of the exposure. And those different versions of the exposure can be related to different potential outcomes, thus creating ambiguity when we talk about, for example, the individual level causal effect. So the problem here is not so much that we have different versions of the same level of the exposure, but the fact that those different versions of the exposure have different potential outcomes. And this is what creates the ambiguity. This is what creates different individual level causal effects for the same individual. Because I'm not sure what is the exact contrast I'm making, what versions of exposure and unexposure I am comparing. And this happened in our example because the exposure variable was not defined with sufficient detail because I just separated individuals into whether or not they were overweight or obese or not. And this is, of course, a very sort of broad categorization of individuals. And this vague definition of the exposure groups resulted in the comparison between them being a ill-defined or ambiguous comparison. And the consequence of that is that we are not sure what is the individual level of causal effect, even though we know the potential outcomes, because we don't know the exact causal contrast that we are making. So the implication here is that the more detail I use, the more precise I am when I am defining the exposed group and the non-exposed group, the better defined the causal contrast will be, and therefore the more interpretable it will be. So in our example, we could say, okay, Instead of using overweight, obese, yes or no, we could use the nutritional status of each individual. So we would have a four-level exposure variable, underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obesity. But we could ask ourselves, is this detailed enough? For example, we could have concerns about variability in BMI within each nutritional status group. So one could say, okay, let us use BMI as a continuous variable instead. Okay, but it is possible that two individuals have the same BMI even though they have very different body compositions, after all, the, the same BMI or the same change in BMI can be achieved in different ways. And therefore, even though they have the same BMI, they might have the sort of a different version of the exposure. And I mean, we could go on and on and on about it. And I think the message is pretty clear. The message is that in practice, it is very difficult to define groups with enough detail to guarantee there is no possible ambiguity, to guarantee that there is no variance in the version of the exposure for a given exposure level. And this is especially important in observational studies because in trials and experimental studies, the groups, the comparison groups are often defined with a lot of detail in the study protocol in advance and et cetera. So this is where the assumption of exposure variation irrelevance comes in. This assumption essentially postulates that the potential outcome is the same or at least very similar for all residual versions of the given level of the exposure for all such levels. And of course, the more detailed definition of the groups, the more plausible this assumption is. So in our example here, we would say, I know that overweight obesity, yes or no, is a very vague thing. So it is very likely that I have different versions of the exposure within each subgroup but I am going to assume that those different versions have the same potential outcomes. So I have no ambiguity in the individual level cause effect. And notice that this assumption is perhaps not very plausible if I adopt the overweight obesity definition, but it might be more plausible if I use the nutritional status definition, for example, because it is more refined. So the point that I want to communicate really is that Again, the more detailed the definition of the exposed and non-exposed group is, the better we are going to be, even though we might have some residual versions of the exposure for a given level of the exposure. If those groups are defined with enough detail, then it might be safe to assume exposure variation irrelevance. So we discussed a very simple example where the ambiguity arise because of a very broad categorization of individuals into exposed and unexposed groups, but such ill-defined causal contrast can arise in many different ways. For example, the exposure to aspirin could be further divided according to the brand of the medication or whether or not it is expired or not, 
No hypertension could be further divided into normal tension or hypertension. Drug user could be further dividing according to drug type or frequency. Being physically active could be further divided according to activity type, duration, frequency, and etc. So really for almost any definition of exposure status, it is possible that there are multiple versions of the exposure for a given exposure level. But again, if the groups are defined with enough detail, then we might be comfortable with the exposure variation and relevance assumption. And even though we focused on the definition of the exposure here, it should also be said that the outcome should also be defined in sufficient detail for us to have a well-defined causal contrast. And let us consider a very simple example of that. So let us take the situation we discussed in past videos, the effect of aspirin intake on Fernando's headache. In the example, the headache was gone 30 minutes after Fernando took the aspirin. So notice it is very important to specify the time because it could be possible, for example, that if we had measured headache status only 15 minutes after the aspirin was taken, perhaps the headache would still be there. So this is just an example. We could think about other ways of further defining this. For example, would an expired aspirin work? Again, thinking about the definition of the exposure, perhaps it would, but it would take longer. So we would need to redefine the timing of the measurement of the headache status. So really what I tried to communicate in this video is this idea that in almost any practical situation, the definition of being exposed or unexposed has some ambiguity, has some vagueness. So in practice, we would almost always need the exposure variation and relevance assumption. But of course, this assumption is going to be more plausible in situations where the group were defined with enough detail. I hope you enjoyed this video. And in the next one, I'm going to wrap up our discussion about well-defined causal contrasts. Stay tuned for that.